right? So what you've looked at now is essentially so far is the sum of forces in the x direction must be equal to zero. Sum of forces in the y direction must be equal to zero. So what that makes sure is that this uh, little cube here is not accelerating um, in the x direction and it's not going into space in the y direction. The one thing that we have not looked at is what is the consequence of the sum of moments around zero. So these two gave us two equilibrium equations for the 2D example that we looked for the um, equilibrium equations. Let me just write it like this. This is a 2D case, and if we were to extend this philosophy just for some moments in the z direction, in a general, in a 3D case, that results in three equations, uh, three equilibrium equations. Okay, so that is what it results in the three dimensional case. And what I'm going to explore today is, is what is the consequence if we do sum of moments around any point in that structure. I'm going to do the sum of moments around this point here. And so essentially, let's, let's, cut, let's start tackling on this. So what we have is, uh, we have essentially on this edge here, we have a normal stress. And we have the shear stress there. So let's first talk about the normal stresses. So that normal sigma xx is just a sigma xx that's distributed on this face uniformly on this face. So if I were to integrate it, its centroid would essentially act through there. The same on this side here. There's a sigma xx that is now varied from this edge to this edge. So there's a partial component that is added there. But if we were to integrate it over this, this face here, the, the force would act through that point. So these two forces would essentially act through the midpoint. And the same for the, for the vertical uh, forces that are normal to this face. They would all act through the centroid, and then actually um, they all run through this point O, so they don't have a moment, they have a zero moment arm around this point. So we can essentially, um, all that we left with that can have a moment effect here are essentially these shear components that we have. Okay, so let's start off. So in this phase here, we have essentially a shear component with the arrow pointing downwards. So if I think about it, this is a positive moment. This one here is pointing upwards, it's also got a positive moment. So let's write them down for now. So let's get that written down. So sum of moments. Around O, I've got here the tau x in the y direction. Uh, so that is that. But this is now just still a stress. I need to get it force multiplied by dy, multiplied by 1. And then essentially the moment arm is just dx over 2. Okay. And then I've got this side the same story. The only difference is now I've got tau xy plus tau xy variation over x uh, multiplied by its area. Make this now a force, and then its moment arm is over 2. Okay, so that is what we have there. Then I have got these two contributions here. So at the bottom I've got um, tau yx pointing in this direction, but if I look my arms in the opposite direction, so it will be a negative. Tau yx multiplied by dx multiplied by 1 for making sure this stress becomes a uh, force by multiplying by the area, and then essentially uh, the moment arm is just dy over 2. And then I can say negative, just quickly, just give me one second. Okay. And then uh, at the top, similarly, it will also be negative. Uh, moment around this, that point, uh, and essentially, because it will be, um, and essentially, what we have is then uh, tau yx, and then the variation of tau yx with respect to y. Get this now into a force, and then moment on dy over 2. All of that must be equal to zero. So that is what we have. 
And uh, what I'm going to just do is now here at the bottom, I'm going to be I'm going to write all the terms that are just these normal terms without the partials. I'm going to write the top and all the partials I'm going to write at the bottom. So we can just organize things a little bit better. Okay. So what I have is here is I've got tau x y uh, times d y times d x over two in a tau x y times dy times dx over 2. So the two halves will make a 1. So I'll just write it as dy dx. And then that's one half and that's the other half. Uh, same for this. I've got here negative is tau yx, tau yx, um, a half and another half will make a 1. And then um, these partial terms I'll write here at the bottom. So this partial term, what I get is I'm still run 100% on the board. That's great. Let me say dx squared uh, over 2 dy. And then I get here, so that is that term. And then I get this one here is uh, negative partial tau yx partial y okay so that's what I have and all of this must be equal to zero so these are the two equations Oops. that is clear okay if I start looking at what's going on I can first let's reason about what's going on here so what we have is, is we have tau xy, we have a d, dy dx and a dy dx. Uh, here we have a variation, so that's something that is a small variation because of a small distance, and we have sort of multiplying it by a, a sort of a differential, or th in this case, a dx squared. So something small in dx squared, um, I'm going to argue that these, these terms are sort of really negligible compared to the dominance of these terms. So we can really ignore, safely ignore these terms. Um, for the purposes of what we want to look at in terms of um, the, the size of the, these terms are. And if I do that, um, I can pull out these terms tau xy and tau yx must be equal to zero. You know that that is, this is small, but it's not zero, so this has to be equal to zero. And if that is equal to zero, the implication is that uh, tau xy is equal to tau yx. Okay, so that is the implication of what we have there. And so what it says is, essentially, if I have this cube and I want to make sure that this cube is in equilibrium, then I have to make sure that, that tau xy is equal to tau yx, if there is no local couple there. But if there were to be a, a small I'll local... Thank you, Shatsi. Thank you, Hazelmaus. If there <laughs> were to be a, uh, if there were to be a uh, moment here, for instance, then tau y x can't be equal to tau y, uh, tau y x because essentially the moment would have to be able to be unbalanced to counter that moment that is locally acting at a point in that structure. But this is a very special case for where you have a structure. Uh, or a kind of material where locally at each point you can actually in invoke a so sort of a, a local moment. And so that is typically materials that you'll have to create specially. And the purpose in this course, um, the materials don't have local moments that act at points. The moments are a result of macroscopic forces being applied. Okay. Just take note in the previous uh, version of the videos that I uploaded, I made an argument about this thing, if it's not square, um, then essentially the, the task would be different which was absolute rubbish, a statement that I made there, because the reality is, there's just reason to do this. If I um, think about what, this, what is this tau, if I wanted to convert it to a force, I multiply it essentially by that distance there, okay? Same if for this uh, tau, if I want to create it by a, to a, to a force, I multiply it by that distance there. So if this thing is in any case, um, the way I've written it is in terms of dy dx, they don't have to be the same. Because if this dy is longer, then this force that acts on, on here um, will be larger because it's, it will be sort of a tau yx that's multiplied by a much larger area. So the gain that this 
this uh, force here at the top has with the moment arm gets countered by the fact that this force is then, force is then larger. So what I wanted to say was not that the tau xy's and tau y's x's, what I should have said was not that the tau xy's and the tau y x's uh, are going to be different, it's that if, if this thing is not rectangular, it's square, but it's rectangular, the forces that result would be different, and the moment arms, but um, because the forces are just different because the areas would be larger and smaller, respectively. But the consequence is that the, 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 the stress version, if I were to divide again by the areas, those components would stay constant. Okay, so just bear in mind that this force, if I make this area larger, this force component would be larger. Um, that would essentially give us then, um, let's say with a normal bending moment arm. And this force here would just be a normal force, but it would now, because this is a larger distance, would have a larger arm. And so those two things essentially balance out. So I just want to make sure I clarify that. This is why I'm uploading, just re-uploading this video because um, I realized uh, that I actually, what I said here was just actually not, 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 not so correct. So I just want to make sure I clarified that. But hopefully what we've seen from this is now essentially we're in a position that we've learned that from the sum of forces in X and Y, we get equilibrium equations and sum of moments, we essentially recover the fact that the uh, shear components um, are essentially equal to each other, the x, y's and the y, x's. And so what this boils down to is essentially, it, this recovers for us uh, symmetry of the stress. So that is the symmetry of the stress tensor that we'll get. And what it implies is that if we um, make sure we construct, a, or if we do the converse and say we construct a symmetrical stress tensor, the implication is we don't have local moments. So this, this is, you can think of it in four direction and the reverse direction. The four direction is, uh, if, you, if we don't have any moments here, we recover the fact that the stress tensor must be symmetric. Because this argument will hold now for, if I draw this one or I have the cube in that direction, um, all of those uh, x, y, y, x, or uh, x, z, z, x, those stress, uh, shear stress components um, would all be um, uh, symmetric with respect to each other. As long as these two components are the same and I swap the order, they will be the same uh, value. And that is the implication of this. The, the reverse version is to say, if I were to construct a stress tensor that is symmetric, the implication is I am assuming this, that these moments do, that don't exist. So then I make the assumption that they just don't exist. Okay, so hopefully this gives you clarity in terms of what we've learned from just doing macroscopic equilibrium on this small little um, stress square that we've driven here, or stress cube, if you want to think of it in that, in that sense. Okay, thank you.